Um, once again, thank you for coming to this conference today. Um, right now, we are going to proceed to the uh, keynote address by Dr. Ravza Kavakchi Khan. Uh, she is the vice chairperson of the AK party. She's a member of parliament from Istanbul. Um, Dr. Khan holds a PhD in political science from Howard University in Washington, DC, an MA degree in European studies from Boazici University, and a BS degree in software engineering from the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, as you can tell, she's spent many, many years in the US, uh, so she's very familiar with the debates here, both on American politics and on Turkey as well. Uh, she was elected uh, as a member of parliament from Istanbul for AK party for the 25th and 26th terms of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. She was re-elected for the 27th term on June 24th, 2018, just last month. Um, and she's currently serving as the vice chair of the AK party in charge of human rights and a member of, she's also a member of the Central Executive Board of the AK Party. Uh, she's served in various uh, friendship groups and committees in the parliament, including the Turkey-China Interparliamentary Friendship Group, and uh, she was the term president of the Steering Committee of the United Nations Con Convention to Combating Desertification Parliamentary Forum. And, She's, she was also a member of foreign relations and EU harmonization commissions in the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Kavak Khan uh, was, was in Turkey at the time of the July 15 coup attempt. Uh, she was just telling us some personal details about it. It was definitely a fateful night for everybody uh, but herself as well. She was in Istanbul, um, and she she um, she had to experience that night um, as a, a recently ra rather uh, let's say a new member of parliament. But uh, of course, I'll let sh let her talk more about that night and what happened afterwards. Uh, we are very appreciative and uh, grateful uh, that she made this long trip. Uh, basically for this conference from Turkey at a very busy time in Turkey. There is all sorts of Im events comm commemorating the July 15 coup attempt and people who gave their lives on that day. Uh, I want to thank her once again and would like to invite her to the podium. Thank you very much. And <laughs> and my colleague Kulic Kanat uh, will be moderating the Q&A session with her. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kadir Bey, for that nice introduction. It's always nice to be back in DC. Uh, I'm grateful uh, to SETA DC for their invitation. Uh, Washington DC has been one of my homes in the United States after Dallas, Texas. So I always enjoy the opportunity to come back uh, to my second home. Um, July 15th uh, was a difficult day for Turkey. I know that a lot has been said about it and there is different uh, perspectives that each person presents. But uh, I wanted to talk about first, uh, in the first part of my presentation, talk about the day, July 15th, and how the Turkish people reacted to it, how did the international community re react to it. But before doing that, I'll try to give a perspective of Turkey. And I know that in the morning sessions, maybe there was discussion about the Turkish history and how the democracy was overshadowed constantly by coup attempts or coups, military coups. And uh, in the next uh, section, I'll talk about post-coup period, the situation in Turkey and in the, the international community's reaction to the situation in Turkey, what the truth is. And um, in the final section, maybe we can talk about, if we have time, I wanted to discuss the future. 
where do we go on from here after the second anniversary of July 15th coup attempt and the current situation in Turkey and how the international community uh, is reacting to the current situation. And then after that, hopefully we'll, we'll have uh, more further discussion during the question and answer session. Uh, the Turkey I grew up in, I know women don't like to tell their ages, so I had a certain age, 35, as a, as a, as a maybe a milestone point for myself. So I would say it's the 11th anniversary of my 35th birthday. Uh -huh. So I'm old enough to remember the stories about previous coups, the 1960 and the uh, previous periods from my grandparents and my parents. And I do remember the 1980 military coup in Turkey. I do remember my fear of uniforms, and my both of my parents were academics at the university in Erzurum. My mother was teaching German language and literature in 1980s at the university, and my father was the dean of School of Theology at that time. I remember how I heard stories of how their students from different political views were taken by the police, and most parents couldn't find their children, and I remember my parents wanted to help their students out, and I remember fearing, what if they take my parents too, because a lot of university professors would be lost. The families would go to the police stations, there wouldn't be any records, and then they would come back, some of them, after some time, and they didn't have much stories to tell, no good stories to tell. And some of them, their families couldn't even recognize them. That was the Turkey I grew up in. Later on, things changed. Uh, and the reason that my family had to move to the United States was because with my daughter later on, uh, four generations of women in my family had to face the horrible effects of uh, headscarf discrimination that was applied in Turkey of that time, the Turkey that I grew up in. But things changed. When we came to Turkey of 2015, 2016, when the coup attempt took place, it was a different Turkey. The state no longer treated its citizens as the other, but the state was now there to serve the citizens. So the citizens, when I, in the Turkey I grew up in, the ones who were considered as the other by the state, like the citizens of different ethnic origins, are ethnically Kurdish citizens, or are Alevi citizens, or are non-Muslim citizens, Armenian citizens, or citizens who had religious, who wanted to live their religion and be able to practice their religion, like the women who wore the headscarf, were no longer the other. And it took, uh, in 2015 was the time uh, after the democratization packages brought by AK Party to the parliament in 2013. 2015 was the first time women with the, who, wear the, who chose to wear the headscarf were able to come to the Grand National Tur Assembly of Turkey and take oath in the Grand National Assembly of Turkey and serve as members of parliament. I happen to be one of them, and I feel honored that I was able to practice um, witness those historical moments as a member of parliament. So July 15th, you know how the events led up to it, I'm sure, but I'll just talk about the day of July 15th. It was a regular day for all of us. It was a Friday, and uh, the parliament had worked till early morning of Friday, and I was in a rush to get back to Istanbul because my daughter, who goes to school, who goes to the same university I studied in, University of Texas at Dallas. She was in Turkey for a couple of days. She was about to leave on Sunday. I wanted to spend the weekend for, with her. And 
We drove from Ankara to Istanbul. I came home later on. News feeds started flowing through different messaging groups on our phones. And then we started hearing the news from friends that there was something going on. We didn't know exactly what. But in a few hours, as I was on the streets of Istanbul, together with uh, people uh, who went out on the streets, those of us who were out on the streets before even the president made the announcement, inviting the Turkish people to the streets, uh, we were out there trying to figure out what's going on and stand up for our democracy. What happened on July 15th was something I don't think happened in any democracy. It's kind of difficult to explain it uh, to an American audience. Uh, but let me uh, try to give this analogy. Imagine your own F-16s bombing the Congress building. That is what we were faced with. For the first time in history, previous schools, there wasn't such an attack. The Turkish Grand National Assembly was attacked. So members of parliament who were close to Ankara, who was close to the parliament, went to the parliament. And these are members of parliament who are from all parties represented in the parliament. They were in the parliament as the parliament continued to be bombed. And innocent citizens, civilians, took to the streets to fight against democracy. Did they have guns? No. Did they have any other weapons of Protect, to protect themselves? No. They just had their flags. And when President Erdogan made the announcement that this was a coup attempt and invited all citizens to take to the streets, as someone who was on the streets, I can tell you, people who voted for him and people who probably never ever voted for him were out on the streets as well. Because these people, some of them are young, some of them are myself, like myself. They know what there is to stake. They remember the old days of Turkey. Yet some of them were very young people who had no idea what was going on, who had never ever been treated as the other, who had ever never maybe faced with the kind of discrimination that their parents faced. So it was a day when Turkish people redefined the concept of fighting for democracy, or standing up for democracy, literally. And when we talk to the families, it's not very logical. It's very difficult to explain it from political science perspective. Uh, the theories I know do not explain this event. Uh, it was a day when they literally said, if I may go and die, but I have to do this for my country. And there were 11 women. Most of them are civilians who were killed on that day. The youngest person who died was Halil Ibrahim. He was only 15. And uh, we had 251 people who lost their lives and 2,194 people who got wounded. And in addition to them, there were millions of people out on the streets or outside of Turkey out on the streets giving support. And uh, they are the uh, nameless heroes of that day, I can say. So the coup attempt, we realized there's a coup attempt. The president invited people out on the streets. And within the 20 within before 24 hours were up, the Turkish Grand National Assembly had an emergency session. It was a Saturday. All of us went back to Ankara. It was a great, uh, difficult trip, one of the most difficult trips I made to Ankara by car, because I didn't know what was going to happen. I have a, a dear driver, young man, who accompanies me. Uh, and I told him, you talk to your parents. If they let you come, you come. I'm going no matter what, but I don't know what we're going to face. If we'll be able to make it to Ankara or something else may happen. So you just make sure, if you have any doubt in your mind, don't come. And make sure your parents 
say, okay, it's okay, because I didn't want to take that responsibility. But when I went to the parliament, it looked like a horrible, horrible, uh, it didn't look like anything I had seen. I mean, I have seen, I have seen a lot of horrible things, but the building was, uh, the glasses were in pieces, there was dust everywhere, and um, my friends who were in the parliament, most of them were courageous, but they were, they were trying to figure out what was going on, and they couldn't believe what had happened. Same way, the prime minister, later on, the main opposition leader, all parties, condemned this coup attempt, and nobody in their mind had any doubt who was behind it. And when the parliament was in session, the next day of the coup attempt, on the 16th of July at 5 p.m., all parties were present, and they signed a common declaration saying that they stood against this uh, coup attempt in solidarity. I know how difficult it is in the United States for parties to come together, two parties to come together on anything. Imagine doing that with four different parties. So that was something big for Turkey. It's important to mention uh, and give credit to all the parties who were there. In the meanwhile, what happens in the international media? I'm giving an interview. President Erdogan, it's about, I think, 12, 12.30 a.m., Maybe minutes before, I may have the times mixed up, minutes before President Erdogan makes a statement. But we know, we heard on the news that he will be making a statement. I'm in Atashir, I'm out on the street, there's a crowd around me. We're trying to calm down the crowd also to figure out what's going on to get news from healthy news sources. and. I cannot remember exactly which international channel I'm giving an interview to, but I'm asked this question. The president is going to make a statement, how come he's alive? First few seconds, I don't get the question. I say, well, later on I react. Are you kidding me? Are you making a joke? You're upset that he's alive? What are you trying to ask me? Later on, international media reaction, in addition to all the fake news from channels such as BBC, what an embarrassment, saying that President fleed Turkey. In addition to those news, I take a lot of international um, interview requests. Again, I'm on live TV. There's so much concern, and there should be concern about all human lives, but there's so much concern for the well-being of the coup attempters. Nobody asks about Halil Ibrahim, who is 15, or seven-year-old young boy who is crushed in the car by a tank. Nobody asks about him. Everybody's concerned about the coup plotters, what happened to them? Yes, we should be concerned about human life. But when September 11th took place, I was here in the United States. I don't think there would be much discussion about the well-being of the people who were behind it. And we all remember how Osama bin Laden was caught. And today, I don't think anybody would be concerned about members of Daesh what happens to them? But this was interesting. We remembered again that Turkey was being held up to a different yardstick. I'm a member of parliament, and I was serving at Foreign Relations Committee, and I was serving at EU Harmonization Committees, commissions in the parliament. And I asked my chairs of my commissions, did you receive any letter from your partners in the international arena, from all these wonderful people who criticize Turkish democracy on many, many counts, all the time. Some of them rightful, some of them not based on any reality at all. No, not single one. Later on, some letters came, but that was, that was just strange for us. 
What happened after the coup attempt? What was the situation in Turkey? State of emergency was declared, like it is done, in all countries where terrorist attacks take place. And this wasn't any minor terrorist attack. And the rule of law was applied. And state of emergency wasn't like the state of emergency in Brussels after the attack, or in Nice after the attack, terrorist attack, or in the situ it wasn't like the situation after September 11th in the United States. Our airport was running within 24 hours after the, the, uh, the attempt. And uh, it wasn't something that affected the lives of daily citizens. But of course, there was great numbers of people who had infiltrated to different state institutions. There were academics. There were people in the security forces, police, people who were members of military. There were people who were members of the intelligence service. So all of this, yes, it added up to an important amount of people. However, the rule of law was up and running because they had institutions, the courts, that were effective. And there are some court cases, because there is uh, the number of suspects go up to 400 people in some court cases. Some court cases, when we look at it from this point, have already been decided on. Some proceedings are continuing. And there are people who were found guilty, and there are people who were acquitted from all the, uh, all the uh, charges. However, in the meanwhile, uh, in the international arena, we see that Turkey is presented as if there is no law and there is, uh, there is no, uh, the coup attempters are being treated unfairly. However, even the people who got removed from their positions or suspended from their positions are able right now to go to the investigation committee of the state of security proceedings. And they have cases. And from those cases, they're able to, once their case is decided on, they're able to take the state to court if they wish. So all the possible, uh, all the possible um, options for everyone to seek for their rights in the court of law are available. Uh, when we look at the statistics, 70% of coup attempt related cases have been decided on. There's a total of 287 cases all over Turkey. I am, uh, as a uh, as the chair of AK Party in charge of human rights, we follow, I follow with my team these cases very closely. We go as just observers uh, to give support to the people who have lost their loved ones or who had loved ones get injured in the, in the coup attempt. Also, we are there to observe the process of justice, how it, how it is applied to make sure everybody gets a fair trial, just like I said, just as ob observers. 171 out of the 287 cases have been decided on. And um, the, in the State of Emergency Procedure Investigation uh, Commission that I just mentioned, which is an independent commission, all the people who have been uh, discharged from their positions have cases in that commission. And this commission has been visited by the European Court of Human Rights and has been uh, commanded on their, on, their, uh, on their system of work that they're doing. Uh, so uh, this independent commission has uh, uh, found uh, the state to be, so far, has found the state to be uh, wrongful, uh, wrongful in discharging in maybe uh, around 2% of the cases. Uh, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about also the situation from this day forward. What is expected in Turkey? We just got the uh, news that uh, hopefully the state of emergency will be lifted soon, maybe in a couple of days before I'm back in Turkey. So that's important. It will help Turkey heal its wounds and go back to normal life. But one of the things that was very disappointing for all of us in Turkey was the fact that the international community, of course, there were nations who uh, gave us their support and expressed their solidarity with the Turkish people right after the coup attempt. But if we generalize, International community, international media did a very, very poor job standing up for the people who stood for democracy in Turkey. So that was a very big disappointment for the Turkish people. And uh, it has also strained our relationship with the United States uh, in that sense. And high level US officials also expressed that before they came to Turkey, later, much after the fact, before they came and visited and saw what had happened, uh, they realized the level of the, of the coup attempt, uh, the magnitude. Uh, and uh, this has caused some strain in the relationship with the United States and with other European partners as well, because we would expect them to stand up with Turkey at the first moment. And uh, this, when we look at it overall, this was a coup attempt that was, that was planned by Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization, which, is, which has a mafia-like cult mentality. It was uh, embedded, uh, it was like an embedded uh, societal cult that tried to overthrow a democratically elected government. And uh, it, it, it took a while for Turkey to, um, it's, a, it's still a long process for Turkey to heal. Uh, however, the Turkish people have done a very, very good job. It's, it's difficult to explain uh, and uh, express uh, our gratitude to them. I think we will always be always be grateful for their courage, uh, especially the 251 uh, wonderful people who gave up their right to live for Turkish nation to live, and and the the people 2,194 people who got wounded. I know when we give numbers, it. It, is, it, does, it doesn't sound uh, so personal, but these are real people. I go and visit their families often. These are real people. Some of them are very, very um, highly educated professors, like Ilham Varank, who was a professor, had many, many students. He was an engineer. And like Abdullah Tayyip Olchok, who was just 16, and he was killed with his father. And there is Jeanette Doanay, who was in the security forces. And there is also civilian mother of three, Ayşe Türkay. So these are all real people who stood, who said goodbye to their families, some of them had maybe babies at home when they were leaving, but they said, this is the day. If I don't have a country, there's no point in having a child with a, without any democracy. So the uh, Turkish nation will always be grateful to these people. I think I pretty much covered everything in my notes. Maybe we'll continue in the question Thank session. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kavakçikan. And, uh, we want to thank you for coming all the way from Turkey for this panel. And this is the third time that SETA DC is hosting Dr. Kavakçikan since the coup attempt. And she has been, if I may say, uh, the most active and hardworking member of the parliament uh, in uh, basically telling the story of what happened in July 15 coup attempt that night. 
And uh, each and every time we have an event on July 15, uh, Ms. Kalakshikan is uh, one of the first people that we think about bringing from Turkey, asking her to come. And we didn't realize how busy. I was following her from the social media, but I didn't realize how busy she was until she started to cancel some of her arrangements to come all the way here. And uh, she has been a member of the Parliament's investigative commission on July 15 coup attempt. And as she mentioned in her remarks, she has been uh, one of the uh, parliamentarians who has been following all of the trials right now going on in Turkey. So she can, uh, we always think that she can bring an insider perspective of what happened that night and what will happen from now on. And uh, I will have a few questions to Ms. Kavakçıkan. And following that, I will uh, collect a question from the audience. And I will keep in mind that she has a very busy schedule. Uh, my first question is, so after two years of the, this has been an issue in Turkish civil-military relations, and after the EU reform process, actually, in 2002 and 2007, between 2002 and 2007, many people thought that never again, there will never be another coup, especially after the postmodern coup of 2007, which military tried to interfere to the political process through uh, a message on yes. internet. So this was something like, uh, we call it e -coup right now, but it was showing that the military is also adapting to the changing realities of social media and trying to interfere the politics through social media. So uh, we were expecting a never again moment, but the coup happened. So can we say that after two years now from the July 15 coup attempt that there will never be another coup attempt from Turkey? And considering that the uh, state of emergency will be lifted, can we say that uh, from now on, no group can infiltrate to the security establishment in Turkey? Definitely. Definitely, we can say that. Uh, as you mentioned, I was a member of the commission that uh, was investigating the coup attempt, but we weren't only investigating coup attempt, but we were uh, investigating what we later on called, started to call as FETÖ, uh, Fethullah Gülen terrorist organization. So when we were in the uh, commission, one of the findings we had was this wasn't something that took place in one week or one month or a couple of years. So this was a process that goes back to 1970s. And there are reports, reports prepared by intelligence, saying that this group uh, at that time is uh, Fethullahçı group that, mm -hmm. that they call, supporters of Gülen. This group are uh, getting organized in security forces. And there were intelligence reports warning the governments of that time. There is one in early 90s. There is one at the end of 90s. But these aren't taken into consideration. Uh, so this was a very hard lesson uh, for Turkey. And they seemed like an organization that was a friendly philanthropist organization with lots of educational institutions, uh, would sponsor a lot of students. but. When the dark side was revealed, of course, nobody ever imagined a coup attempt like that would come out of this. But when the dark side was revealed, they realized they're not going to be able to do their activities that they cover up, like philanthropy or education or intercultural relations. And that's when it became a big problem. And then afterwards, they tried to, to, tried to do this. Uh, they tried to take over Turkish democracy uh, without, without going through the fair elections. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a hard lesson learned. No, it's, it will not be possible for any other organization to do something like this ever again. Uh, the Turkish people, we know that will not mm -hmm. allow it because Turkey has changed. That's why I wanted to give that overview at the beginning. Uh, the Turkey I grew, on, grew up in, I had no human rights. Most people didn't have human rights. Only the political elite, they had some rights, and those rights affected only them. When you, when you made a statement that uh, was against criticizing the state, the state could, would never, ever forgive you. Mm. But if you attacked me or if I attacked you, 
the state could forgive the attacker without asking the attacked. So that was, the, the, the citizen had no value in the Turkey I grew up in, but that's not the case. And that's why I wanted to give some names and I wanted to give some ages. I mean, Halil Ibrahim never knew that Turkey, but still he was happy with the country he lived in. That's why he was, that day he was out on the streets. And knowing that there was a danger, he was out on the streets like many others. So that's one of the most important points. So we have, we've, we've learned a horrible lesson. But uh, one thing that reminded me um, from your opening statement is this. Also, before the coup attempt, I was on the delegations as a member of a Turkey United States Parliamentary mm. Friendship Group. I was on the delegations who would come and visit the uh, Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And we would speak to congressmen, congresswomen, and uh, we would speak to senators and representatives and tell them about the danger of FETÖ. I grew up in Texas. They're, they have lots of schools in Texas. They're very powerful in Texas. And later on, after the coup attempt, we continue to emphasize that they are a danger for the United States. They cannot be trusted. And uh, they, in some states, like California, their schools have been closed down and they are under observation. But this is a group that cannot be trusted. It's a danger for the United States as well. Second question is about the future. So the election is over in Turkey and both the par presidential and parliamentary election took place in June 24th. And uh, the quest my question is, what will be the policy priority of the AK Party? Uh, in uh, his uh, victory speech, President Erdogan made a statement saying that AK Party will get the message from the voters. So what is the message and what will be different in the new Turkey with the new governing system? Of course, uh, I, I was elected to the Grand National Assembly on June 7th elections uh, in 2015. So I'm saying after I got elected as mm. a new member of parliament, the regular term used to be four years. Before my four years were up, we had three now general elections. And one we referendum a, in the middle. We had, we had a referendum. We had uh, three, uh, we had change of leadership in our party. Uh, and uh, President Erdogan uh, came back to his party with the referendum change, uh, with the constitutional change as the leader. And we also had a change in the whole system. And I'm, I'm really, I, 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 feel, I feel already uh, uh, very experienced. Uh, so we had our first elections. After the uh, previous year's referendum on April 16th, uh, you know that the Turkish people decided to switch to the, from the parliamentary system to the presidential system. So it, it first practice of the presidential system or as far as the voters were concerned, was on uh, the 24th of June. And on the same day, we voted for our members of parliament as well as uh, our president. And uh, we gave the president the authority to form his cabinet. So it's a new system, new page for all of us. Uh, when we were going for elections, our, uh, one of our campaign slogans was, uh, we said that we want a strong parliament, and strong leadership and a strong uh, executive together working with the legislative. I think the Turkish people gave that answer. Of course, uh, from the presidency's point of view, we have more than 50% of the votes. When we look at the coalition with MHP, we have more than 50% of the votes. But AK Party, who is, who is the president's party as well, could have done much better. Uh, what makes AK Party different uh, from other maybe political uh, political movements is uh, we listen to the people. If we don't listen to them, they let us know yeah. what their <laughs> demands are. Their Turkish mm. nation is very, very open about it. We had 87% voter turnout, which I'm really excited about. Uh, some of these voters didn't vote for us, but they, one of the things that we said during the campaign as well was, Yes, we would love for you to vote, but no matter who you're voting for, please go out and vote. 
So it's important. So 87% water turnout when it's summer, it's a very good number. And the results are very good. But uh, we have to do our homework. There was a lot of, a lot of criticism or a lot of demands in certain areas. Mm. We are very good at health, we know, we, but we need better services. Uh, as far as municipal services are concerned, we need to check our report card very well. Uh, because we have mm -hmm. elections coming up, so we can in March win 2019. In March, uh, that's right. So uh, we have to we have to prepare for that as well. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, demands in relation to the area of education. Mm -hmm. So now we're we're very excited because we have a brand new, uh, very uh, very uh, young, dynamic uh, cabinet, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're looking forward to working with them, uh, in harmony with them in the parliament. And we have a lot of harmonization laws that need to pass through the parliament. So coming back to the beginning, what makes that party different is we listen to the people. But we know that Turkish people don't only want just services. Mm -hmm. They want us to win their hearts. So mm -hmm. I think we have more hearts to win. Uh, hopefully, we will do that. We have to do it by 2019 elections. Thank you. I have a third question, but let me see if the audience are ready to ask some of that. We can start from here. And I will collect two questions at each. Yes, uh, Robert Friedman, Johns Hopkins University. Thank you very much for a very nice lecture. Uh, really gave us the feel for what happened that evening. My question relates to the Kurds. Mm -hmm. uh, you are now in a coalition with the Nationalist Party which may be a constraint on the AKP. Now that President Erdogan is, at least from the presidential point, strengthened his position, do you see any new openings to the Kurds the same way in the first decade of his rule? President, then Prime Minister Erdogan, had a number of openings to the Kurds. Mm -hmm. Let's get the gentleman over here, and then we will go to the next two. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the second or third time that I uh, address you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Could you give us an idea what it means, the lifting of the emergency uh, session? Mm -hmm. Does it, in fact, mean that the press will be freedom, more freedom mm -hmm. to, uh, to express its opinions? Does it mean that journalists will be released from jail? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that, that uh, people have more of a right, which are, they talk about human rights, mm -hmm. to speak out, to, to express their opinion. And the other question I have as a member of parliament, does this election in fact mean that President Erdogan has a rubber stamp now and that there will not be very much protest, very much uh, two sides, doesn't mean what we call a rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your comments. You want to start Should with sure. the first one? Uh, on the issue of the Kurd, uh, Kurdish issue, uh, I have to say this very openly, clearly. There is no Kurdish problem in Turkey. There is, however, a problem of terrorism. PKK, which is an internationally recognized terrorist organization by the United States, by the European Union, by many states in the international community, uh, is a problem in Turkey. And unfortunately, we have HDP in the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. In the previous term, I hope that it will change during this term, they have been representing, voicing the concerns or the demands of PKK terrorist organization rather than the demands of the people who they represent in the community. So there is no Kurdish problem in Turkey. There were rights violations, major violations of rights, but that's not the case. Uh, and we have, this is something, I, I mean, I don't know how I can express this very well, if I'll be able to. We have members of parliament, members of the cabinets who are of Kurdish origin, or who are ethnic Kurds. But this is not something that's an issue we don't ask it would be rude to ask. It's like asking somebody their race or their preferences on certain issues. So it is, we don't, AK Party doesn't have a Kurdish issue, Turkey doesn't have a Kurdish issue. However, something did take place, unfortunately, when there was, there was um, negotiations 
And when there's negotiations, two sides have to keep their promises. Unfortunately, after the June 7th elections, what happened? The PKK started attacking and killing innocent civilians again. And we are very, very, we're very strong on our position. As Turkey and as AK Party, we will fight against terrorism. We have to deal with PKK, PYD, YPG when we pass the border to Syria or Iraq. And Daesh, ISIS, all kinds of terrorist organizations and FETÖ. We will fight against them until the end. Uh, and we hope that we'll get more support in that sense from the international community. Um, this state thing of, of the emergency. state of emergency, uh, there is a lot, uh, a lot of, uh, we hear this a lot that uh, journalists are in prison, academics are in prison in Turkey. Uh, I don't have any information about any academic or any journalist or anyone from the security forces or any doctor or anybody from any profession for being, going through the court system or being imprisoned because they have criticized the government or criticized the state or anything like that. Uh, supporting terrorist organizations and promotion of terrorism is illegal in most developed nations, as far as I know. Uh, I don't think in the United States we would have any, any sympathy for someone who would support any activity of ISIS, Daesh, or as I gave the example of September 11th, if we, if we look at the situation in Turkey, that's one of the going back to Fethullah Gülen. I mean, that's as a friend of Turkey, uh, I have a hard time as a friend of the United States from Turkey, as someone who has family and friends in the United States, uh, I find it hard to understand that Fethullah Gülen is enjoying a nice life here in the United States. Imagine, instead of Fethullah Gülen, uh, I know people don't like comparisons. Comparisons hurt. But the closest thing I can compare it to is September 11th. The attackers of September 11th. Imagine a NATO member, your ally, hosting them. So that's, that's one of the things that I hope we can I have a hard time getting over sure. it, but I hope we can do that as well. Let me collect another set of questions. Gentlemen over here. Over here. Thank you. Please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Ergement Ackman. It's a bit of a related two-part question. Uh, some members of the parliament would like this investigation committee to reopen the discussions on the coup attempts, but also, as we know from uh, Daniel Ganser's book of NATO secret armies in Western Europe, in your findings, the big question still is, who was behind the coup attempt? And did you find any leads that linking the, the coup attempt um, and the coup organizers having links to NATO or other sources? Gentlemen over there. <clears throat> Hello, Wright Smith. So you're a political scientist by training. Political science research shows pretty clearly that coup prevention practices degrade the capabilities of armed forces over time. Obviously, Turkey has had to respond to a coup attempt, and that has required investigations within the armed forces, removing of officers from positions, changing the promotion patterns mm -hmm. and ideological makeup that those are based on. How can Turkey try to balance the needs to prevent future coups with still also maintaining military effectiveness as a very valuable NATO member? Thank you. Um, the investigation yeah, of who the was behind the coup. Uh, of course, it wasn't just Fethullah Gülen. He had supporters. Uh, but Can you uh, give us a little background about the Parliamentary Investigation Commission, oh, how course. long it worked? And of Who course, was in the I, I think uh, there were there were members. Uh, all the all the investigation committee commissions have members from the opposition as well as the ruling party. So we had members from each party represented. 
depending on their number of seats uh, depends on how much they are represented in the parliament according to the percentage. Uh, and uh, we had uh, members who were lawyers who had academics uh, in the, in the, as members of the commission. And we had people who uh, are uh, psychiatrists mm. to military experts to intelligence experts to someone who was a member of the Fethullah Gülen uh, cult organization, later on was uh, branded as a traitor uh, for, a, for, a, for a reason he didn't understand. And uh, after being uh, branded as a traitor, he was mistreated. And that's how he fell apart from them. And uh, it's interesting, that gentleman, when I asked him the question, if you hadn't been branded and as a traitor and you saw their dark side, uh, would you have parted mm. from them? And he said no. Mm. And that was something that really scared me. So that's, uh, I think, something that reflects the cult man mentality. Of course, uh, uh, we don't have any facts as far as, we didn't have any findings as far as such and such nation supported it. But there were, there were some groups that, uh, there was some discussion of different international uh, actors uh, helping or supporting the coup attempt, but there isn't anything that I can share with you right now. Uh, on the second question, uh, I think, uh, yes, armed forces, uh, Turkey has one of the strongest militaries in the region. Uh, we're very proud of our military, but uh, going back to, again, uh, the old Turkey that I grew up in, uh, especially during the uh, soft coup, the e coup period of, nine, yes, if nine, of 1997. Uh, at that time, the higher security, National, National Security Council would meet, and the first, first uh, threat that would come out of the meeting was not PKK terrorism, which was still taking lots of innocent lives or the economic problems Turkey had. It was a time period of um, a lot of economic, I mean, um, the nation was almost going bankrupt. But number one threat, and military was very, very, had high weight on that National Security Council meeting. Number one problem was a word named irtija. Irtija meant, means, being backward. What did it mean? Being what? Uh, being religious, practicing religion. I mean, I was irtija. If you look at me, I definitely was irtija. So at that time, unfortunately, during the coup times, military, instead of protecting its citizens and protecting its borders, the well-being of the citizens, that's my, I think, second alarm telling me my time's up. Uh, and I have no giving, job here. So. <laughs> <laughs> giving, uh, instead of uh, taking care of the well-being of uh, the citizens, what was it acting as an actor in, in uh, discriminating against citizens? Now, this, I think, is a normalization process for the Turkish military as well. And now we have a ministry, as you know, just recently, the Minister of uh, National uh, Security, is the uh, yes, uh, Mr. Hulusi Ak Akar, who is the former chief of staff. So now the military will be working under him, and they will have representation in the cabinet. However, they will be they will be the military will continue to serve the Turkish people for the well being of the Turkish people, and not as a as a political actor on its own. Thank you. As you hear the voice, actually the time is up, but I will have one final question. Sure. Since it is, uh, you are speaking at, in Washington DC and you have been following US-Turkey relations, what is your perspective about the future of US-Turkey relations? Well, I'm always, I'm always an optimist. I'm always hopeful, but we know that we have had our ups and downs and uh, we had, 
we had we have certain agreements that we are waiting for the United States side to fulfill. But uh, Turkey and United States are long-time allies. Uh, like I said, we have our ups and downs. Uh, I am I am hopeful, especially after the agreement on the situation in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, we had our red lines uh, as recognizer of PYD and YPG as an extension of PKK on Syrian mm -hmm. uh, soil. And we want the people of Syria to live in a peaceful society. We want the massacres to stop. And Turkey has done its humanitarian job uh, hosting 3 million, more than 3 million Syrian. We don't. We still don't call our Syrian brothers and sisters refugees our guests, uh, and uh, we have done our share. We we want the massacres to stop so they can go back home, and we're glad that United States and Turkey together will make this happen. So that's I think a good step for uh, increasing the strength of our relationship. Thank you very much. Please join me thanking Ravza Kalakchikan. Thank you.